her death and after. So as you can see, uh, this is a poem which is written in the narrative style. In the narrative style, as in it goes along as if it is a story, right? Uh, so therefore, like a story you see from the very beginning of the poem, uh, or like a traditional story from the very beginning of the poem, the setting or the context where the story is taking place is established. And there are, of course, the character. There is the poet persona, and uh, there is the, the mother of the child who dies, uh, and then the child's uh, father, the child's actual father, as well as the child herself, who appears as characters in this poem, in this poem, right? And uh, you also see that uh, though it, the poem goes on, though we like move on in the verses, uh, still certain sections of the poems come uh, as a conversation, right? So we see the utilization of the indirect voice, which is used in the poem, and then the direct voice when you see certain quotations, conversations, which are passed on between uh, the different characters. So therefore, that is the reason why we say that this is uh, in the narrative form, because there's a setting established, there are characters, conversation goes in the form of a dialogue, and there is a clear development in this story, right? Though it is all incorporated in the poem. Okay, now let's uh, go through these lines. So as it, as it was mentioned in the recording, her death and after uh, was taken from his poetry, from Hardy's poetry collection called Vesser Poems and Other Verses, which was published in 1898, right? Which is published in 1898. Um, so here he says that, Twas, twas the deathbed summons, and forth I went by the way of western walls so dear, so drear, on the winter night and saw the gate, the home by fate, of one I had lo so long held dear. And there, as I paused by her tenement, and the trees shed on me their rhyme and hope. Um, so you see that the Victorian poetry, this is a Victorian poet, and Victorian poetry is also marked by this preoccupation with death. So that becomes like a very predominant uh, thematic preoccupation that Victorian poems usually engage with. So just, uh, so in this poem too, you see a preoccupation or meditation with death uh, disease and other disturbing uh, subject matters, uh, giving a very undeniably morbid kind of effect here, right? Uh, morbid effect is like a very, that means like a very uh, gloomy kind of effect because there is a uh, preoccupation with death, preoccupation of death, as well as disease, right? The preoccupation with not disease, uh, we can just say death because throughout you see the mother's death seems to be uh, seems to be affecting uh, affecting the poet right affecting the poet as well as his family um, and then he as he said in the beginning of this uh, discussion we also see how the poet is establishing uh, the context or the setting of this poem as well right. Um, so therefore, like if you go to the beginning of the poem, uh, he it's it it mentions that it was a deathbed summons. So that means the poet has been summoned or asked to visit this woman at her deathbed when she was dying. So therefore, it is evident from the very few first few lines of this poem is that this summoning of the deathbed. This is a poem which is going to be. Uh, unquestionably morbid, undeniably morbid, right? It engages and preoccupies with death. It is a meditation on death and itself uh, and its effects afterwards, right? That is also the reason the poem is uh, very, uh, in, the poem is entitled, entitled Her Death and After. So what happened after death and after her death? 
And there you see the, the setting is clearly established. He says that uh, by the way of the Western Wall on that winter night, right, that he goes to her, he visits her tenement. So tenement, reference to tenement here is like a land. And then he describes about the trees that shed on him uh, in her land with rhyme and hope, right? And uh, you can also see this reference to the fact that uh, this is a winter night is also important because you see these kind of images in uh, GM Hopkins poetry as well, um, where he's conveying or talking about winter in order to convey negative connotations. So even here you see that uh, this is a deathbed summoning, a summoning of a deathbed by a woman who is dying. Uh, to talk about the things she regretted in her past about. She recollects her past moments with the poet, right? So therefore you see that the setting of the winter is stereotypically incorporated by the poet in a very traditional way. And we say that because winter is here associated with negative connotations in the poem, right? Why do we see negative connotations, it's uh, used with, with regard to negative connotations in the poem. Um, and that is because, uh, I have it here, negative connotations. And the, re the reason why uh, death, uh, the reason why winter is evoking negative connotations in this poem is because uh, it is a poem associated with a preoccupation with, it is a poem associated with death, right? It is a preoccupation and meditation with death. So that is the reason why we see, we say that the setting of the winter, it connotes a negative kind of atmosphere, negative connotations as well. And then he says that, uh, I thought the man who had left her alone, him who made her his own, then I loved her long before. So now you see that uh, after the setting is introduced and when he's summoned to uh, this woman's house, uh, we are given a context as to a background as to what's the past between the poet, this uh, woman, as well as the husband, right? So the poet says that um, he, he thinks about the man who had, uh, who had made her his wife uh, after, he was, after he was in love with her, right? So you see that what is conveyed in these lines is that this was a past lover that he has now, that he is now no longer in possession of, right? And you can always see how nature, in this poem, how nature is always intricately, as well as in an elaborate manner, interconnected and intertwined with uh, what is happening, right? So when it comes to Thomas Hardy's poems, uh, when it comes to his uh, the context that he's establishing here and uh, the deathbed summoning, which, he, which is taking place in, this, uh, in the few, next few lines, we will see that along with that, uh, the, uh, the, the nature is connected because uh, he's talking about a winter night. And then he's also talking about how the trees are shedding rhyme and hoar, right? So or, with all these visual images from nature, uh, you can see that inevitably the poet is talking about a very morbid subject matter as uh, natural images are intertwined with the context of the poem or so intertwined. We can say that the natural images are deliberately intertwined uh, by the poet along with this, uh, along with this situation, right? Along with this situation as well as subject matter. I think subject matter would be a better word here. And then he says, the room within had a piteous shine, the home where the home things were, which the housewives missed. From stairway floated the rise and fall of an infant skull whose birth had brought her to this. So you see that uh, from the way the room is described in this stanza, uh, it is very moving, right? And always uh, negative connotations are again associated with the, uh, the lines home things where, uh, which housewives miss. And also the piteous shine of the room, right? So again, 
you see negative connotations which are associated with these uh, words and phrases. And um, then he's may perhaps referring to the fact that uh, then we are given more context as the fact that he's uh, talking about the death of a past lover, uh, a woman who had married another man and who is now uh, who is now uh, sub who is now dying at her deathbed due to pregnancy, right? And then she says, uh, then he says, but her life was the price she would pay for that wine, uh, for the child by the man she did not love. But let that rest for it, I said, and bent my tree to the chamber up above. So now you see like uh, the poet is indicating the fact that it is her life that she is paying for this wine, for having this child of a man she did not love, that is the husband, right? But then like he's coming into like an understanding of uh, uh, coming into trying to come to an understanding with what took place or the bitter feelings which took place in the past and saying that let his feelings or bitter feelings or regret that he has rest forever and then he approaches uh, her groom right and it says she took my hand in her thin white horn and smiled her thanks though night to weep and made them a sign to leave us there, then faltered ear she could bring herself to speak. So now she's taking his hand and bidding everyone else to go outside the room, right? And then she's like making herself uh, reveal, uh, reveal what she has hid, maybe concealed from him before. So he's now there, they are physically there at her deathbed, right? And then you see, uh, but then you see like the start of the conversation between uh, between the woman as well as the poet with this dialogue, with these forms of dialogue uh, throughout the next few stanzas. Even before that, you see how the poet has incorporated the direct voice when he's speaking to himself. It says, but that let that rest forever. Here he's speaking to himself. And here you see with uh, line number 26, uh, he's now starting a conversation or a dialogue with the woman says, so the woman says, "'Twas not to see you before I go, heel can join. Such a natural thing, now my time's not much. When death is so near, it hustles hence, all passion sense between woman and man as such." So he's, uh, she's saying that uh, the husband will condone letting them meet because now she's at her deathbed. Uh, and then she says, my husband is absent. Uh, as hereforth the city detains him, but in truth he has not been kind. I will speak no blame, but the child is lame, or pray, I pray she may reach his room. So now you see that uh, the poet is revealing the very sad and unfortunate circumstances of the marriage between this woman and her husband, right? So this is not a kind of uh, very traditional and conventional expectation of uh, familial bliss and post-marital happiness that you see the woman is revealing here at her deathbed. But the fact that uh, he has, the husband has not been kind to her, that is what she's revealing. So she never experienced uh, post-marital bliss, right? Which is the traditional expectation of marriage. Uh, and she also says another unfortunate circumstances, circumstance, circumstance, that is the fact that ch the child is born lame, right? So the child is born with a physical defect. And then she says, for you past days, I can say no more. Maybe if we beat wedded, you'd now repine. But I treated you ill. I was punished, farewell. Truth shall I say, shall I tell? Would the child were yours and mine? So now you can see this uh, pervasive fatal fatalism uh, again, which is incorporated in Hardy's work. Uh, fatality because uh, this is a woman who was uh, doomed, right? She had loved, she had married a man that she did not love, and now she's regretting the fact that she did not marry the poet in the past and had the child with him instead. Uh, so she's regretting being ill-treated the poet in, the, in her youth, right? So, 
and he she's wishing that she's wishing that she had married the poet so you know that uh, this cannot uh, realistically happen so therefore she's talking about impossibilities she's talking about realistic impossibilities here so therefore we can see the pervasive uh, fata fatality fatality of this doomed woman right um, who believes that she was punished now and then she says as a wife i was true but such my unease that could i insert a deed back in time that i'd make her yours to secure your care and the scandal bear and the penalty for the crime so she continues on to like uh, talk about uh, talk about her unfortunate circumstances and you see like what is conveyed through all these tens tensas is an emphasis on fatality how this doomed woman is helpless in the face of fate right she had already married this man and now she cannot ever undone the actions that has taken place in the past right so you see that her regret is highlighted and accentuated through these tensas as well because she's talking about the uh, possibilities of the past but things which can never take place in the uh, present because now that now that she's in her deathbed right and then she continues on to say when i had left and the swinging trees rang about me as lord in her candid say another was sigh her words were in a came smooth came rough i felt i could live my day and after saying these words you see the next night she dies right uh, next night she died and her obsequies and her obsequies in the field of tombs by the via renowned had her husband's feet his tenants spent i often wept and pondered by her mouth so now the woman the next day after talking about talking with the poet poet like this she dies right and then uh, the, her family holds her funeral rites so that is a reference to uh, obsequies here and then uh, you see that the poet after her death he's visiting her gravestone right he's saying i often went and pondered by her mound so he visits her gravestone in order to contemplate and then he says all that year and the next year wild and i still went to the ward in the gloom but the town forgot her and her nook and the husband took another love uh, another love to his soul and the rumor flew that the lame child lame lone child whom she wished for its safety a child of mine was treated ill when offspring came of the new made dame and marked a more vigorous line so now she's uh, now you see the hard is talking about the mutability and the transitory condition of human life right uh, if i write those words in the white board the poet is talking about the mutability the mutability as well as and uh, transitory nature of human life and condition right because uh, he's she's he's basically talking about uh, how humans are subjected to change right when the dead are gone people change and they move on and that is what he's mentioning here the husband moves on after his death after the wife's death and then he married a new woman another woman right but though these things happen uh, you see that the poet has not changed right so the poem therefore he refuses to move on and he continues to think about this woman and uh, there is another thing which you have to understand here you see that this child who was born lame uh, is growing up in loneliness right is growing up in solitude because now the child is ignored so now you see the emphasis is on the fatality of the disabled child uh, her the child's vulnerable and uh, and helplessness against fate why because the child was born lame and then after the father married the a new a new wife uh, the the woman the 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 wife starts ignoring the child so you see that the child therefore becomes the 
ultimate victim right after her death her death as in the mother's death so after her death you see that the child becomes the ultimate victim because the child is uh, doubly marginalized right why is she like uh, doubly marginalized so one reason she's sub marginalized is because she's a she's born a girl right in the patriarchal society and uh, another reason why she is is because she's lame so she's more disabled uh, which marks a physical defect right so she's even more marginalized than the other woman and moving on to these lines So you see that um, this stanza is actually marked by the grief of the poet, right? The grief, this stanza is marked by the grief. These stanzas are marked by the grief and the turmoil of the poet, because he says that uh, though he knows about these situations through you, rumors, a smarter grief within me brought than even at loss of her so dear, dead, and beings whose soul, whom whose soul my soul suffused, her child ill use I helpless to interfere. So you see that uh, it is marked by the grief and the turmoil of the poet uh, because, of, because he feels uh, helpless, right? And he feels helpless because of his inability to help this child as he's a person who does not have a right to help this child. It is not his child, right? It is a child, a poor unfortunate child of a past lover whom he loved a lot, who is now ignored, uh, ignored in the family because she was born lame and she was from his past wife. And then he continues on to say in line number 71. And then um, he says, uh, one eve I stood at my spot of thought. Actually, uh, we will skip these two stanzas and here, the reference to gladiators uh, from imperial Rome are gladiators who were both professional and amateur fighters in imperial Rome. So he, from there, he goes to uh, the Christian time, the Christian time where this, uh, this, is, this present context is taking place in his own contemporary time, right? And then he says, scars had night the sun golds touched this place in line number 81 from the vast rotund and the neighboring dead. When her husband followed board half past with lip as cast as whole thing sullenly said. Um, so now the husband gets to know that the poet is constantly visiting uh, the, his, his old wife's, his previous wife's uh, grave and his contemplating. Um, so he goes and he, uh, and he uh, meets with this poet and he then you see a conversation between the poet and the husband. And here with the reference to neighboring dead, again, you see like this preoccupation or medication uh, with death because now it is not talking about literal death. What uh, Hardy is trying to convey here is the fact that the neighborhood is asleep. But you see that even the neighborhood, being that the people in the neighborhood being asleep, is even associated with the image of death, right? So therefore you can say that death seems to be a recurring element in this poem because the poet is, the poet continues to meditate and he's constantly preoccupied with death because this, it, the poem started with summoning to the wife's deathbed and it talks about the repercussions the child has to face after the death of the mother. And then again, he's talking about how the husband and the uh, poet meet in the night, and that is described at uh, a, in a, that is described in a way that they are meeting at a time where the neighborhood is dead, which is not being the literal death, but the neighborhood is sleeping. But again, that is also associated with death. So you see that the poem is recurrently and co constantly associated with the image of death. It's a preoccupation with death. And then the conversation, the dialogue starts between the husband and the poet. So the husband asks, it is noise that you visit my first wife's tomb. Nay, now I gave her an honored name to bear. 
while living when dead. So I claim to ask, by what right you task my patience by vigiling there? Uh, so he is asking that uh, he gave his wife an honorable death. Um, and he's asking with what right are you like coming and visiting her tomb? So you see after that, the two men, they proceed to have a conversation uh, regarding the taking uh, of the, regarding the uh, position, regarding, the t uh, regarding taking care of this disabled child, right? Because he says there's decency even in death, I assume preserve it, sir and keep away. For the mother of my firstborn, you show mind and you, sir, I have nothing more to say. So now um, he's talking, the poet is talking with the father about the fact that how this uh, disabled child of his first wife is uh, ill-treated, right? So therefore you see a decency is not practiced after the death of his first wife. And that is what the poet is uh, accusing the father of. And then it says, a desperate stroke discerned, I then, God pardon or pardon not the lie. She had sighed that she wished, lest the child should pine of slights to your mind. So I said, but the father right, that you thought it yours is the way of men, but I want her troth long ear, your, long ear your day. You learnt now in time, she summoned me. Twas in fealty, sir, I have nothing more to say. And then he is, uh, you see that after when talking about the, the circumstances of the child, the poet lies in an attempt to take the child with him and to like, uh, and, to, and to take care of the child. Why? Because he knows that the child is ill-treated and because he knows that he has no right to take over the ownership of the child. So therefore he lies to the lies to the husband and says that it was my child. Though she was your wife, it was my child. Um, and then he says like, that therefore the child should be given to him. He should take care of her. And then he says, save that if you'll hand me my little mate, I'll take her and I'll rear her and spare you toil. Think of uh, more than a friendly act none can. I'm a lonely man while you a large pot to boil. So he's attempting to convince the father now in order to hand him over the uh, ownership of the child because the father has his own family now and therefore the child can be easily taken care of by him who has nothing else but the child to focus on. So he says that he's a lonely man so therefore he can take care of the child who is his Oh, right? And that is, of course, a lie. You know that it's not true, but he's trying to convince the father to give him the child out of, uh, out of his uh, affection and out of the pity that he feels towards the ill-treated child of a woman he once loved. And then the husband, uh, he responds that, he responds in a negative way to this. He disagrees with him, right? He says, save that. If you, uh, if not, uh, and you'll put it to bail or blade. Uh, tonight or tomorrow, heaven, any then. Uh, I'll meet you there, but think of it. Okay, so before uh, the father is like disagreeing with it, I, I, I said it in an incorrect way. Basically, the poet is giving the father time to think about it, to contemplate holding him the ownership of the child, right? And then um, after that, it says, after saying all that, the poet goes away, right? It says, well, I went away hoping, but note I heard of my stroke for the child, till there greeted me a little voice that one day came uh, to my window frame and babbled innocently. So he did not hear for a long, for quite some time, but then later on, uh, he hears uh, in front of his house, a little girl has come and innocently, in a very, the innocence of the child, the purity and unadulterated unadulter nature of the child is uh, emphasized here by the use of the language, he, by the poet, right? Because she's saying that the child comes to his house and uh, babbled in a very innocent way through uh, his window. And the child says, my father, who's not my own, sends word. I'm to stay here, for, sir, where I belong. Next, a writing came. 
Since the child was the fruit of your passion's fruit, pray take her and right a wrong. And I did, and I gave the child my love, and the child loved me and estranged us none. But compunctions loomed, for I harmed the dead by what I said for the good of the living one. So basically, the child, the husband has agreed to hand over the child to the poet uh, in the assumption, in the belief that uh, it is not his child and that is the poet's own child. And uh, he's asking him to like uh, take care of her now. And then it says that the poet does, and then he had, uh, he loved the child and the child loved him. And then after that, they were alone. They weren't in lonely anymore. They weren't in solitude anymore, right? So you see that this is the only positive development that you see in this poem, uh, in this narrative poem. Uh, because uh, after, after the death of this woman, after the death of his past lover, after this tragedy he faces, now he has someone to bestow his love towards, so his paternal love towards, that is towards the child. But despite this, he says that compunctions moved, right? Uh, for I'd harmed the dead, he harmed the dead but by lying, by lying to the husband that this was his child when it was not, right? right? Because the wife says that he was true to her husband at her deathbed. So due to this, uh, due to this lie, uh, he's now having compunctions. Uh, now he's now having compunctions because uh, he lied about her faithfulness in marriage. And then he says in the final stanza, yet though God, what I am a sinner now and unworthy the woman who drew me so, perhaps this wrong for her darling's good she forgives or would only she could know. So he takes care of the child uh, to correct a wrong that he believes in. That is what he did, does, right? He saw that the child was ill-treated. He heard that the child was ill-treated in her family. So therefore he, uh, he corrected a wrong which is happening by taking care of the child. Uh, but then he's also worried over the fact that he was unworthy of a woman he loved in the past, right? However, despite this hint of positivity that you see in the poem, uh, where the child and this uh, poet is united in paternal love, uh, you see, you still see how uh, Thomas Hardy engages with fatality, right? Because he talks about the doomed aspect of this relationship, and uh, he says that it is possibility that uh, it is possible that the poet says that it is possible that he will be considered as a sinner and as unworthy because of this lie he mentioned when the wife was completely faithful to her husband. But then he also ponders over the fact that perhaps she might forgive uh, me because uh, he's taking care of the child, but only she would know this, I wouldn't know. That is how the poem ends. So you see that the poem, this is a poem overall, we can say it is uh, very direct and straightforward. It's very easy to understand. Uh, you can like uh, go through the stanzas and easily understand the plot, right? So therefore we can say that uh, it is written in terms of having a chronology, right? So the story therefore moves in a direct and straightforward manner. It progresses forward like a chronological story, right? Chronological story means that uh, it is a story which goes from A to Z, right? There's a beginning, middle and end. So therefore, we can say that it seems to have a traditional structure of a story. You see the context is established and the beginning where the poet is summoned to his past lover's uh, deathbed. And she talks about her regret. And then you see a development after her death, the father, uh, the husband takes on a new wife and the child is entreated. Uh, towards the moment, uh, the husband con confronts the poet who is always visiting the grave of her first wife, and a climatic moment happens in the poem where the poet lies and tells the father that this is his child and not her, not his. So therefore, he should give the that he should give the uh, ownership of the child, the king via the child instead. So that is the climax of the story, and then you see it gradually going towards the happy ending, uh, get, growing towards an ending, which is not entirely happy to, right? Though the uh, 
though the child and the poet uh, are together and they love each other as a child as a father, still the mother is dead, dead and then he has also lied about her faithfulness, right? So therefore, uh, but despite this, uh, you see a beginning of a story, a development towards a climatic moment, and then gradually reaching a conclusion uh, in terms of observing the chronology of a traditional story. So that is what we see here. And also the doomed aspect of this relationship is highlighted. There you see uh, Hardy engaging with uh, the fatality of this, the fatality of this relationship, of this doomed love of uh, the poet as well as the uh, as well as the po poet, as well as the uh, wife. And then he also talks about the fact that uh, how he would be declared, he, that there's possibility that he's considered as a sinner for lying about uh, her, the actual circumstances of child, right? But he keeps that for himself. Okay, so that is what uh, we can understand with relation to this particular poem. And uh, these, uh, this is the place where we will stop this lecture. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you for listening.